Welcome to Quest Connect today. I wonder if you remembered that it was daylight saving. Most of us have um, little watches and phones and all sorts that uh, tell us that um, the time has changed these days. Although I do have a couple of clocks I had to change as well. Maybe you're the same. Just double check in that I'm live on my phone and I am so I can put that away now. So welcome to the 2nd of April. Can you believe it's April already? I'm Margie Bronstein. I am a senior facilitator here at Quest. And I don't know where you are. I'm in beautiful Darkenjong country here in um, central coast of New South Wales. And of course, we always acknowledge our elders and past elders and present, of course, elders who make such a terrific contribution in our community and also emerging leaders in the Darkenjong um, tribal uh, traditional owners. So yeah, I'd like to acknowledge the lands we're on and also to welcome everybody to Quest Connect today. So today I thought we would take a look at anxiety. It is a pet subject of mine because I would say, um, as it is for many, many people, anxiety has been really with me my entire life. As long as I have living memory, um, I remember being anxious and gosh, one of my first memories as a three-year-old is feeling anxious. Um, so it, it is something, and I'll talk a little bit about some of my experiences, but of course, we each have very unique experiences of these emotions and our lives are also different. Um, but I will use some of my past to illustrate as well. So I thought what we talk about is making friends with anxiety because anxiety by nature is something that um, is an emotion that causes us to run away, right? To pull away, to avoid, you know, the, the fight flight part, the flight part is about fleeing, right? So implied in anxiety is a desire to avoid, to run away, to get away, right? And then we translate that to wanting to get away from the feeling itself. And, you know, like I've been, I could say battling, but I've been working with anxiety my whole life and it used to feel like a battle. Now it doesn't so much. I've really made friends with my anxiety. It's there, I can find it, I can find it right now. Right, it's always sitting just there if I look for it. I'm pointing to my solar plexus. Um, so let's today talk about making friends with anxiety and how to do that. So I hope that's a topic that interests you because I don't think there are many humans on the planet that don't go through some level of anxiety from mild anxiety to complete panic attack, um, you know, the whole spectrum at some point in your life. Let's start today with a coming to your senses, this lovely little mindfulness practice, which is just about, you know, anxiety is driven partly by our worrying about the past and did we get it wrong? and should we could we have done it differently what if i'd left earlier what if i'd married someone else what if i'd been a better mother you know would my kids be having all that stuff that ruminating mind or of course even more so when we cast our mind forward into the uncertainty the fantasies of catastrophe the concerns about the future all the media driven fear mongering that's out there that drives all that so we know that this anxiety can be run by what's going on in our mind. But we also know that when we just come back to the present moment again and again and again through the day, through the week, through our life, it gives us a little holiday from that. So let us take a moment to come to our senses, just to run through the senses of the body. Take a breath, breathe out. I'm going to close my eyes. You certainly do not have to close your eyes. You can lower your gaze. You can keep your eyes open. You don't have to change your posture. You know, it's a very non-judgmental practice. You can just drop into where you are, how you feel right now. So let us begin. As I said, closing your eyes or lowering your gaze. And just taking a moment to bring your awareness from wherever it's been, whatever you've been looking at, whatever you've been doing, talking, whatever activity you've been engaged with, and bring your awareness inside your own body, just inside the senses of your own body. 
And let us start with the feeling of touch. Just be aware of how your clothing makes contact with the surface behind you, where there's a little bit of pressure behind your thighs, your back, your feet on the floor, your feet in their shoes or socks, slippers maybe. Just notice that pressure brings awareness to that sense of touch, your clothing on your skin. Now where else do you notice the sense of touch? Maybe the movement of air across your hands or face. Notice how your clothing moves when you breathe. Just that subtle movement of clothing against your skin. And notice the touch of air inside your nostrils. Notice how your senses, the little nerve endings in your nostrils, pick up the temperature of the air and any perfume or scent on the air. The rise and fall of your belly or your chest. And bring your awareness into your mouth. All the rich source of sensation in your mouth. Your lips. The tongue as it rests on the floor of your mouth. Your teeth and jaw. Just fall fu feel fully into your jaw. The upper jaw and teeth the lower jaw, all of the sensation of the jaw. And now gently shifting your awareness to your eyesight. Color, light and movement. any tension in the eyelids. Just bring awareness to that. There's nothing you need to change. The fluttering of the eyelids. And your hearing. What sounds fall into your hearing? What sounds are outside the room? When you notice thoughts have come back in, it's absolutely fine. Just go back to the sounds. Come closer in to sounds inside your building. Just all the sound. And lastly, your breath. How does your breath move your body? Just be observant of that. The rise and fall of your chest or abdomen. And when you're ready, maybe before you open your eyes, have a little stretch, a little blink when you're ready to open your eyes. And when you're ready, just bring in your awareness back. I hope that I'm not coming through fuzzy. I think I might be a little fuzzy today, uh, which probably is the Wi-Fi because it's pouring with rain here on the Central Coast. So hopefully it's a good enough reception. Just checking if there's anything I can do to fix that. I don't think so. Mm, says the internet access is pretty good. All right, so just notice how you feel when you do one of those little coming to your senses. And really you could choose just one sense. I often just choose the weight of my body on the chair or bringing my awareness into my hands and just being aware of my hands. Or you might be auditory and you like to take your awareness 
anytime you can just take a little break just come into one of your senses you know do that on a regular basis and the more present we can become in moments throughout our day the more it turns into being present in our life in actual fact so let us talk about anxiety and then of course making friends with it so what even is anxiety you know we know that it's biological and that um, when we do feel anxious it's not something that we have often a lot of conscious control over it's just the body's warning system really that something is scary something is a threat but the question we always hear over and over again and one that I've asked myself many times in my life is how do I get rid of my anxiety now people ask this about all kinds of emotions right how do I get rid of my anger how do I get rid of my sadness how do I get rid of right and really this is not just about anxiety this is about any emotion because we don't just slice off emotions and then they're gone right that is not the path towards peace of trying to actually rid yourself of emotions you know I'm a psychotherapist and the way we talk about it is how to integrate and regulate various emotions so even though you might say and you know how do I get rid of my anxiety a better question is how do I calm myself when I feel anxious how do I use my anxiety to actually um, enhance my life what can I learn from my anxiety because when you're trying to get rid of something it doesn't necessarily go away so look we know that anxiety prepares us to flee right it's part of that fight flight it prepares us to to run and when we're feeling anxious it's part of our brain the amygdala you know the hand model of the brain we talk about it quite a bit so imagine that this is the brain stem it comes up into the back of the neck here through the mid parts here in this model in the middle of the brain you've got all of the little um, regions of the brain that are around emotions and we share them with our mammalian friends right the hippocampus the amygdala the insula the interior cingulate cortex, cortex the hypothalamus the thalamus all these little regions and structures in the brain which help us regulate emotion and they're largely operating at a subconscious subcortical level when I say cortical I'm talking about the cortex of course that's the neocortex that wraps over all of these little structures and it's what we generally recognize as the brain this gray matter that folds around over the top of everything else and then we call that the brain because it looks like the brain that we would see in a picture or a drawing of the whole brain you mainly are seeing the neocortex which is the newest part of the brain and so when we say that we are getting activated into our anxiety it's because that part of the brain the little amygdala that sits in here just behind your nasal cavity if you went straight in just in there right that's what's taken over and it's very automatic and when you do that your rational part of your brain this prefrontal cortex just flips offline right so the amygdala that little part of your brain creates an intense emotional reaction which sets off a whole flood of chemistry to prepare your body to run away from a threat right your body very instinctually goes into oh, I'm in danger something's going to hurt me there's a predator chasing me there is a danger warning warning Will Robinson I know that shows my age sorry um, and really when it all boils down to it anxiety is about really controlling so that we can get in control of our body and get it away from a, a perceived threat so therefore it's about fear I mean fear is a fabulous thing for saving our life if you didn't live with fear you probably wouldn't be able to live we need fear to live it helps us to recognize danger you know fear anxiety is just part of fear and it helps us to recognize danger and get ourselves away from it if you're walking in a place and suddenly your instincts tell you oh I feel unsafe I think someone's following me right you want to mobilize your body to look for support to look for protection to run if needs be all right it's a good thing the, the fight flight freeze our autonomic nervous system you don't want to lose that the trouble is that we overuse it we use it in places where there's no real threat all right we get wound up we call it the default mode network in the brain and the default mode network sits around here somewhere the prefrontal medial prefrontal cortex in here somewhere and it is that part of the brain that when you have you when you experience danger 
It will then plug it in and wire it into this part of the brain so that next time you perceive a similar danger, you'll go on to alert, right? Um, and look, that's a good thing, apart from the fact that we overuse it, right? Because often we're reactivating that um, alarm system uh, just from a thought. Maybe there is no actual physical danger, but we reactivate it because we worry and worry and worry and worry and worry some more. Isn't that how it works? So, you know, fear of the future, trying to control things. My own brand of that is a good whack of perfectionism. You know, as a child, I felt, I think I felt, you know, I've tried to analyze it over my years of therapy and soul searching. I think I felt a little unsafe at times in my family for whatever reason. My parents didn't mean for that to happen, but it happened anyway. Um, my perception was I was unsafe. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll just be, I'll just get everything right. I'll never get anything wrong. And if I am trying constantly to never get anything wrong, that goes with an anxiety that of course, at any moment I could get something wrong. You know, and I do not like failing. Failing is not an option. And you know, the more work I've done on myself around this, the more, has anyone else got some perfectionism going on as well? The more I realize that you can never get anything perfect and that it's a really exhausting way to live. Like mine has played out through never having a sick day. Um, really in most of my working life, I'm much better now if I'm unwell, I will take a day off. But for most of my working life, I virtually had no sick days until really the last couple of years. Um, or maybe working way too hard and preparing way too much for a simple presentation. I had to give a six minute presentation once at a big conference and it was six minutes and I really think I did, I don't know, but at least 50 hours pre you know, prep on that because the pressure of the anxiety of getting on that stage and making a fool of myself, that was just not negotiable. Right. How much pressure do we put on ourselves? You know, every child that's ever lived had to fall over thousands of times before they got up and walked, hundreds of times at least. Children don't judge themselves, right? They allow themselves to make mistakes, but we don't quite often. So perfectionism is there, stress is there, fatigue is there. There's lots of reasons why. But basically, once you've got those neurotransmitters and all the chemistry that go with the thought, with the fear, whatever it is, there's a whole cascade of connections that go off that control our nervous system. That then affects the heart rate, which speeds up. The breathing rate speeds up because you're about to run away from a saber-toothed tiger. Um, the signals to your muscles become very alerted and ready to run and, and blood flow is diverted out to the muscles, to the bones, ready to run. When this all happens, when you're in the, the flight part, all of the energy t goes away from your digestive system, right? As your body prioritizes everything you need to mobilize yourself to get away from whatever it is that you think is threatening you. So there's the fight function in there as well and fight and flight are very closely linked. But we know anxiety is part of the flight. So this is why some of the symptoms of anxiety are feeling restless. You know when you can't sit still because you think, God, I've got to do something, right? When you feel anxious, you have to do something. There's an imperative to fix it, to do something. And this is why people who have a lot of anxiety tend to overfunction you know, and overfunction and get restless if they have to sit still because they're not doing anything to escape, to run, to fix it, to make it okay, to control things, right? Very anxiety making to sit quietly, come to your senses and just have a little space where there's nothing to do. Very high anxiety and staying calm are the opposite of each other, aren't they? I want to talk about anxiety just for a little bit longer and then we're going to talk about how to make friends with it, of course. So stomach churning, I get butterflies kind of in my stomach. What are your symptoms of anxiety? I'd really love to hear from some of you. I can't see if there's anyone joining me just because of the nature of the way my... Um... Oh, hello, I have got some people here. Hello, oh, I see someone familiar. Hi, darling, nice to see you, Kai. Yeah, I have to scroll down to see, so it's nice to see some people are with me. Um, 
feeling wound up or on edge that's a very common sy symptom where you just feel your mind is racing you just feel really wound up you can become easily fatigued because when you've got a lot of anxiety you're actually using a lot of the vitamins and minerals that your body gets from its nutrition right and so we can become very easily fatigued our muscles feel worn out um, you know we're not really meant to feel anxiety as much as we do and anxiety is really meant for acute stress moments when you need to mobilize yourself to get away from something that's actually threatening a predator chasing you a warring tribe um, somebody threatening your life or the life of your child um, that kind of thing you're meant to spend about five percent of your entire life in that kind of anxiety where you mobilize yourself to survive the other 95 percent roughly i mean i'm making up the stats um, but you know it, it, i'm just saying you're meant to spend a lot of time feeling okay in rest and digest in calm in balance in flow you know, where you sit around and enjoy other people's company and eat and dance and talk with each other around the metaphorical fire in community. You know, that's what we're meant to spend most of our life doing. But many of us have got it the other way around, where 95% of our time is caught up in this and only a very small percentage of time is in the resting phase, in the de-stressing part. You can also have trouble concentrating because your mind is your brain is caught up in survival so it's really hard to concentrate on anything else when your bo whole body is ready to go because there's no way you're going to have a, something chasing you and you're going to be sitting there working out a maths problem you know or doing anything creative because there's, there's this impulse all the time to keep moving you know it drives got to keep moving got to keep running, got to keep alert, hypervigilant, isn't it? Isn't that what it feels like when we're anxious? Like it's really difficult to calm down when you're anxious. Um, but we need to be aware of this, it drives irritability. Um, you might get more headaches as you've got your blood, you know, your actual blood pressure is up, um, muscle aches, stomach aches, and just that incessant worry that then leads to sleep problems. All right, so we want to do whatever we can to manage these symptoms of anxiety because they can really interrupt the joy and happiness that we have in life. Then you've got a bit of social stigma um, with anxiety that, you know, there's some idea very media driven. You know, the more I realize how influenced we are, I was listening to a podcast yesterday um, and they were talking about uh, the algorithms on social media. And it really struck me how much comes in when we're looking at Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever, Reddit, Telegram, Snapchat, LinkedIn, Twitter, it doesn't really matter what platform you're on. All of those companies have algorithm, algorithms that bring content to your feed, which is more of what you, like it, it backs up. If, you, if you're Googling, if you're searching stuff around certain topics it'll bring you more on that topic right so you know you start looking for golf clubs on google and you'll start getting more ads for golf clubs you start looking for oh, my gosh is are all the banks going to close uh you know like is the world going into a session are we going to lose all our money right you start worrying about that and you start looking for what people are saying on facebook or whatever and you'll get more of that coming into your feed does that mean there is more actual reality that it's worth or does it mean that there are more people talking about it you know and it's very hard to work out what's real because the media works on selling advertising so it wants to say things that are highly emotional that trigger our anxiety because when especially if you already have some anxiety issues it makes you want to read more and go more onto that platform where they get the chance to expose us to more advertising of whatever products they're selling and people you know it's just goes around and around and I think for myself and for everyone really we need to become conscious of how manipulated we can be in that system and start checking out like I love a bit of scrolling on social media but I also want to be conscious of how manipulated I can be by that and really be a bit more conscious of not getting sucked in right um, unfollow 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 those things that come into my inbox that I don't want to know about um, but there is a social stigma 
if you have a lot of anxiety it's not something we like to admit to people in the workplace um, you can be bullied for it uh, people that love us often don't understand it you know they'll say things like but you've got such a great life what have you got to be worried about that happened years ago and what you read through the lines is don't be stupid you're you know there's nothing to be anxious about but I have yet to meet a client or a participant at Quest that doesn't have a reason for feeling worried right and so we need to stop telling ourselves that our feelings are not valid that we're stupid or shameful because we have any feeling mm -mm -mm. there'll always be a reason why you feel anxious so let's stop beating ourselves up for that it was when I finally turned around and thought well I feel anxious let's have a look at that in a self-forgiving a self-compassionate way that really I started to be able to manage it while I was just trying to close it down and tell myself I was stupid and a loser for having these feelings nothing ever changed it just wound up and I started drinking more and you know that glass of wine at the end of the day that would um, help to ease the anxiety the second glass was even better and the third glass well that helped me get me off to sleep you know, I actually gave up alcohol at the end of 2016. I have had a, I just had a rest for about a month. I thought I'd give it up for a month because I'd been drinking since I was 14. And while I wasn't drinking to excess any longer as I used to in my 20s before I had kids and a family, um, I felt that I was a bit dependent on it for stress relief. You know, wine o'clock, ha ha ha, all those jokes. Now, I'm not saying everyone needs to give up alcohol, but I swear that in the last six years, my anxiety levels have fallen so much do I still have anxiety yes all the time every day there wouldn't be a day go by where I don't have some anxiety but on a general overall level it's gone from this to this you know it's still not nothing but it has definitely I'm sure out giving up alcohol has been a large part of that because it was overstimulating me constantly so I guess the point I'm making is that anxiety is not an enemy and nor is any other feeling that you might have either but for the sake of today's talk, anxiety is not an enemy. There's that old saying that was um, originally coined by Carl Jung. Carl Jung was a um, peer of Freud, so a long time ago. And he said, what you resist persists. What you feed grows. You know, what you focus on grows. So whatever we are constantly have our antenna, our internal antenna. I know I look like a, a bull or something but whatever you've got your antenna on whatever you're searching for that's what grows right you will find what you're interested in it's part of this part of the brain back here called the reticular activating system that seeks out what you're interested in now if what you're interested in is that you're not safe oh I'm not safe oh there's another place I'm not safe oh I don't think I'd be safe there or oh, that wouldn't be safe oh no and you end up not leaving the house right because you can see evidence of where you might be unsafe might feel unsafe everywhere and it drives anxiety and it reinforces you know that I better stay anxious um, so we need to be aware of that and start to reset our antenna yes there are places where we won't feel we won't feel safe and you need to make some really good clear decisions around how to protect yourself if you're going into a potentially unsafe situation but at the same time look how many places in the world could be safe going to visit that friend at their house would that be safe probably right so get your antenna up for where am I safe where do I feel the safest how can I bring experience into my life that's the opposite of anxious right we need to reset that internal radar so anxiety doesn't go away just because you want it to go away right in fact you when you're going I don't like feeling anxious I don't want to feel anxious I'm not feeling anxious I don't want to feel anxious anxiety is bad there's something wrong with me I'm feeling anxious what are we focusing on right there's a common word happening in all those statements right? anxiety so what you focus on grows so I guess when I first um, started doing therapy back in the <coughs> 1980s long time ago now um, really right from the beginning every therapist I had said to me you need to move towards your anxiety not away from it and I heard the words but I didn't really make sense of it I'm just going to check if anyone has put a comment in in case I need to respond to everything anything that's all good uh, ooh. 
I'm seeing a few people, so thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so you know, when we're not sort of grasp the concept, I mean, I'm bright enough to understand the concept of you know coming out of resistance, but I thought, why would I want to give myself permission to feel a feeling that I already don't like? Why would I want to feel it more? It took me a long time to make sense of that. Of I'm just looking at the time, why I would want to make friends with my anxiety. But here's the thing, when you actually move towards the feeling, when you actually feel the feeling, as we say in our mansion of emotion, give yourself permission to feel it, feel it with awareness, it actually dip, dissipates quite quickly. You know, if you can feel it, you can heal it. It's the opposite of what you resist persists. It's like what you go toward dissolves, right? It's okay to feel anything, right? If you're in a genuinely dangerous situation, then you need to act on that. But to be able to sit there and go, this, I'm not actually in danger at the moment. Use that rational, pardon me, rational mind just behind our forehead here, the prefrontal cortex. And go, am I actually unsafe at this second? Right? If the answer is no, but you are churning with anxiety, then what can I do to help calm this anxiety right now? And one of the easiest things to do is to go into it instead of away from it. So if you like to do a little practice, one of the easiest ways I do um, going into it um, is to do this little practice. So it's very common, a lot of psychologists use it, but let's just do a little practice of it now. So you can close your eyes, but you don't have to. But either closing your eyes or lowering your gaze. Just notice your breathing. And begin to scan around your body. And see what feeling feels the most intense at your body at the moment. Just have a little, you might have more than one intense feeling in the, in the body. Choose the most intense. It doesn't have to be anxiety, it could be anything. For me, I can find anxiety quite quickly. Now, where exactly is that located physically? Just notice where that is. How far inside your body is it? Is it just under the surface of the skin? Or is it deep inside the body somewhere? Is it a centimetre or five centimetres? Be specific in your own mind. Does it have a shape? Has it got a defined shape like a cube or a sphere? Or is it somewhat floppy and jelly-like without any defined shape? And what's the texture of it? Is it like rubber or water? Is it like feathers? Or is it like a steel block, dense and heavy? Is it warm or cold? Heavy or light? Does it have a colour? Or is it see-through? And on a scale of 1 to 10, if 1 was hardly there at all, and 10 was very intense, what number would you give it? And when you're ready, just opening your eyes. Now I usually need to do two or three rounds of that for it to start to settle. And it may not work for you, it doesn't work for everybody, but it is a little hack if you like on how to move towards it. And what we're doing is instead of saying, I don't want to feel that, we are focusing in on it. What size, what color, what shape, what texture, whereabouts is it? You know, as you ask yourself those questions, you are going towards it, you are going into it. And some people call that the disappearing technique, the acceptance practice. You know, there's lots of ways of talking, the dissolving practice, the surrender practice. Because instead of saying, I don't want to feel that, you're going, oh, I feel it. And you do it at a level of sensation instead of adding all the story into it. Now, the story might be real and valid and need attention. 
but it, it can feed the anxiety when we ramp up the kind of thoughts that go around our sensations. And this is just a way of coming back to the sensations and just letting go of all the thinking around it for a moment. So you might even record that for yourself in your own voice and ask yourself those questions. Um, if you go to the Insight Timer app and look my name up, you'll see it's a, just a free app called Insight Timer. I've got something called the Acceptance Practice there where I run you through those questions. You're more than welcome. It's just a free thing that I have on there. So how'd you go with that? What was that like for you? So some of the other tips we have for making friends with our anxiety, being able to regulate really is the game. Not to make it wrong, but to, you know, one of the things I do is that really helps is what is the message for me? What is my anxiety trying to tell me? It's like knocking on the door and it's telling me something. It's telling me I feel frightened of something. What is it I feel frightened of right now? You know, and then as we say in the mansion of emotion, once I've given myself permission to feel it with awareness, then I might be able to work out what I need. You know, am I in a, a situation that feels unsafe that I need to withdraw from? Am I with a person who's not kind to me or is a bully or abusive even, and I need to get away from them? Am I in a work situation where every day I turn up and it's telling me I don't like it here? Do I need to plan to t change jobs? Do it safely so I don't make myself financially, you know, in, in more anxious? You know, what do I need? And that way you can, your anxiety is telling you that there's something scary around you. Is it that you have got a trauma um, pathway in your brain that's really tight, really driving your life based on past traumas? In which case you need to work with someone who's trauma informed to help you unwind that part of the brain, those neural networks that have formed around the trauma. Because that keeps on activating the anxiety at a level below conscious awareness. And you absolutely can change your brain and heal your brain from that kind of intense anxiety that comes with trauma. Um, so yeah, find yourself a good therapist that can help you to work with that. Uh, because we can absolutely help people to regulate their anxiety using these simple kind of practices. How's time going? Pretty good. So awareness is probably your first key to being able to make friends with your anxiety. Is, you know, going into the room of that emotion, to the anxious room, if you like, to turn, to, in terms of our mansion of emotion, which is just about, I have feelings, I'm not my feeling. I have anxiety. It's not who I am, but it's absolutely what I'm feeling right now. And when I'm feeling anxious, what do I need? You know, do I need a hug? Do I need to hold a cushion? Do I need to go for a brisk walk and walk off some of that cortisol that I've got building, some of that stress chemistry? Do I need to phone a friend and talk it through? Um, do I need to find phone lifeline and say I feel really unsafe? I need some help here. I'm really, really struggling. Um, one of the things we know really helps with anxiety is to slow the breath down a little bit because it's just natural when anxiety starts to come up in our body that we start to over breathe and we start to hyperventilate. You start to have oxygen levels in the body increase rapidly. Um, so one of the, remember the old, <laughs> the old paper bag they used to do with people having panic attacks? We don't use that so much anymore but the reason behind the paper bag was to increase CO2 and bring down oxygen. Right, because when you're really anxious, your oxygen goes up and your CO2 comes down. So we want to balance that out a bit. So this is an easy way to do that. So you don't have to close your eyes, but just take a conscious breath. What does that even mean, a conscious breath? It just means that you're aware, keeping your awareness on your breath all the way in and all the way out. So as you're conscious of your breath, when you get to the next out breath, I don't want you to hold it out for a long time. I want you to breathe in. You might close your eyes. Breathing in and on the next out breath, imagine you've got a little straw between your lips and you're just going to blow the air out all the way. When you've emptied your lungs, 
Just breathe in naturally. And blow out through that little space in between the lips. What this kind of breathing does is it just, because it's a smaller opening, it elongates the out breath without feeling like you're trying too hard. So just a couple more breaths like that when you just narrow the opening through the lips as if you're blowing out through a drinking straw. One more. And while you're doing that, with each out breath, feel a little heavier in the chair. Imagine that as you breathe out, you're getting a little heavier, giving your body weight to gravity, bringing your awareness down into the lower part of your body, the back of your legs, your bottom, all the way down in through your legs, through your calves and down into your feet. Because when we feel anxious, we generally bring our awareness right up high in our body, right? We're churning in our chest, in our gut, in our ears. We've got pressure in our head. We've got a lot of alertness in our eyes. You've got the adrenaline and cortisol making you alert for danger, right? It's a lot of upper body energy. So to calm that is to bring down into the lower body, even having a stomp around lightly. Don't wind yourself up. Um, at, or rubbing your legs, like just give your legs a little pat, right? Your thighs, give them a little pat, right down to your calves and shins, give them a little tap. And bring your awareness down there. Can you hear? I won't stand up because I've got track pants and um, slippers on underneath my dress. <laughs> my husband laughed at me when I was getting ready today. So, slowing your breathing can be a really important part of this. Also, lifestyle. Lifestyle can make a big difference. As I said, reducing, actually eliminated, but reducing alcohol if stimulants are an issue. Alcohol, caffeine, sugar, huge stimulants to the body. If you already have a reason to drive anxiety and then you add in stimulating foods, overstimulating foods and drinks, then sometimes it just makes it worse. And so it can be good to reduce those things. Again, we're caught up in a world of big food companies and advertising where we you know it's very psychologically manipulative what goes on the colors the jingles the placement of food on the shelves you know we are wired in to have all this really cheap junk food but it does drive our anxiety and we become addicted to it and we need more chocolate and we need more you know alcohol and we need more cigarettes and we need more whatever it is but it drives a lot of anxiety now I'm not saying that we need to start restricting all the joy in life. I love having a coffee every morning, but I am aware that if I have it in the afternoon, then it can disturb my sleep at night. So, because it just drives that kind of overwhelmed body. So I can have one in the morning and I can burn it off a bit in my activities of the morning. I'm fine with that. But chocolate, caffeine, alcohol, and sugar, if I have that close to bedtime, forget it. I might be awake at three or four in the morning still. Work out what works for your body. But if you are being disturbed with anxiety um, and your sleep is being disturbed, do whatever you can to improve that. We've got an online course on sleep if that interests you on our website, but there's so much out there on sleep, really. Um, go to your GP, talk to a naturopath, um, you know, like come to Quest and we talk about sleep. Do whatever you can to improve sleep. Um, but if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're feeling really anxious and you know you've got that ruminating default mode going round and round, see one of the things I like is to um, stop thinking, start counting. Or just that little breath, that little slowing down the breath practice we were doing before, take your awareness to the out breath. You might even count it, you might breathe in and count out uh, 10. Let's do it now. Just closing your eyes, again bringing your awareness to your breathing, and on the out breath, count 10. Breathing in normally, 
and the out breath is nine. Breathing in normally and the out breath is eight and keep in that in your own pace for a few more counts. Seven. Don't worry if thoughts come in or you lose count, just start again at 10. Couple more numbers. And then just bring in your awareness back. So if you wake up in the middle of the night and you've got your brain whirring, it, you could just start counting and it might just distract your mind long enough for it to not wake you up fully. But there's lots of tips around sleep, lots of things you can do. Um, and this isn't, a, this isn't a, a Quiz Connect around sleep, although maybe we'll do that next time. Um, plenty of fresh water during the day, lots of good quality water during your day um, can help you to sleep better as well, but also reduce anxiety because it helps to flush out that excess of stress chemistry. Um, a tea and coffee count to some extent towards your fluid intake, but really water is the thing that's going to help to flush you out. Um, spending time in nature. There is something so beautiful, isn't there, about spending time in nature? It calls to that part of us that naturally relaxes. If you can just sit on the ground or get your bare feet on the sand or the grass or the dirt, that really helps as well because you get that exchange between the positive and negative ions. You don't get that if you're in rubber soled or plastic soled shoes. So get yourself on the on the dirt, you know, get yourself even concrete, you still have a connection to the earth. It doesn't, but a lot of other surfaces like rubber undersold carpets, uh, shoes, um, lots of things, you know, like places where we work, they're not connected. There's no grounding to the earth. So if, as much as possible every day, if you can just get yourself connected to the earth, that really helps as well. If you're feeling really, really anxious, if you've got something maybe situational in your life that's driving anxiety, um, it can be really help to relieve mild depression and anxiety just by getting your feet on the earth. Go and lie on the grass, lie on the beach, walk a barefoot on the sand if you've got that nearby. And it can really make a, a quite a, a, an amazing difference to mild depression and anxiety. Of course, see your doctor. We're not against medication here. Sometimes you need to take that medication to help bring you down a little bit. Um, nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, there's good and bad stress. You know, the bad stress, the good stress is gets, gets you out of bed and gets you walking around and into your daily activity. The bad stress is when you're pushing your body beyond its limits. You know, you wouldn't drive a car and not get it serviced. And yet that's what we do to ourselves. We push ourselves past the limit when we feel fatigued and we kill, still keep going. We live in a culture that's very achievement driven and with failure you shouldn't fail, right? You're only meant to be young and happy and slim and beautiful forever, right? What nonsense. Right. Maybe we can just relax into being ourselves. Maybe who you are is okay. There's nothing you need to do. You know, but just relax a little around trying so hard. Um, and what, what, if you could do one thing to reduce stress in your life, what would it be? Even if you're not doing it right now, what would it be? You probably know. I know for me, it would be working less. Why don't I do it? Says she, working on a Sunday. Right? Because there's that little driver in me that pushes all the time. I've got to keep pushing more and achieving more. And, you know, I'm still working with that. I'm 64 years old. I'm still working with that. Right? A lot of people have retired at my age. <laughs> Just saying. Um, don't tell my boss that. I'm not ready to retire yet. Meditation, of course, is a, such a fantastic tool for unwinding some of those neural pathways that get wound up that are really not useful. They might have been useful when the initial stress or danger was there, but that danger has passed and our brain is still wired up for it. Our default mode is still looking for evidence of it. You know, maybe meditation is one of the most amazing tools for unwinding and pruning away those neural pathways that drive the anxiety that are no longer useful. If you can find a practice that you can do every day as regularly as possible, 
or stay mindful during the day when your movements every so often come to your senses be present in whatever t activity you're doing even a few minutes of that the washing the dishes mindfulness you know practice this being in the shower the walking up and down the hall when you get up from today wherever you are and whatever time you're listening to this see if you can just be present on your chair wherever you are in this moment keep your senses alive what's the time we're doing pretty well so learning to make friends with your anxiety is about moving towards it and asking yourself what is the message for me in here what is it I need to hear what is my anxiety telling me you know just imagine your anxiety is a friend and you're gonna go out for a coffee and you're gonna say okay what are you doing in my life I know that you're here for a good reason but sometimes you know I feel a bit overwhelmed by you sometimes I want to push you away is there something some message you're trying to give me you know write a little journal imagine yourself having a little chat with your anxiety what would your anxiety say back to you why are you in my life you know think about that myself why is my anxiety in my life well it's telling me that I'm still afraid that if I don't get everything right that I'm going to be abandoned I'm going to be hurt I'm going to be I'm trying to imagine it while I'm saying I'm going to my fear is that I'm going to be annihilated if I don't get everything right if I don't keep achieving if I don't keep pleasing right if I don't keep getting it right that's a lot isn't it so what is your anxiety telling you if it was a friend that's not a very good friend is it <laughs> but maybe it is maybe it actually is trying to tell me that it's okay to relax that I don't have to push so hard so I have a poem that I'd like to read to you um, which I think is a beautiful poem about um, just what we're talking about and it's called Walk Slowly by Dana Falls I'm going to read it such a beautiful um, poem for anyone living with anxiety here we go it only takes a reminder to breathe a moment to be still and just like that something in me settles softens and makes space for imperfection the harsh voice of judgment drops to a whisper and I remember again that life isn't a relay race that we will all cross the finish line and that waking up to life is what we were born for as many times as I catch myself charging forward without even knowing where I'm going that many times I can make the choice to stop to breathe and be and walk slowly into the mystery isn't that beautiful so that's by Dana Falls F-A-U-L-D-S and whenever I read that it reminds me that we have no control over the future that the future is a mystery yes you can have your plans you can put controls in you want to have a budget all that sort of thing we put in whatever controls we can have but none of us know what's going to happen five minutes from now not for sure not five minutes five days five years from now the only thing we can do the only place you can live is now so to walk slowly into the mystery to be present as you walk slowly you know and to notice when the anxiety comes up that there's a message for you that there's a little friend knocking on the door saying oh, there's something going on stop what if you loved yourself enough to recognize that the anxiety has a message for you you know that you can stop trying so hard that maybe maybe it's not as scary as you might think so embracing our anxiety that's where the action is that's how we learn to soothe ourselves that's how we can come out of that really overwhelming place of panic and anxiety and of course we can't always do this on our own you can listen to as many people as you like talk about this if the wound happened in relationship you may have to find a professional relationship with someone to help you soothe and to integrate those feelings and to feel safe again in the world so finding yourself a lovely therapist finding yourself someone that you can work with is is really important um, as you come out of this so 
So it's nearly time to finish for the day and I just want to remind you that we are here. We'll be back on the first Sunday in May um, from 2 till 3. We are still um, at home with Quest every morning, Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. Uh, and we love doing those sessions as well. Patria is very committed to her Monday night meditation. And you know, anytime you feel anxious, you can go back into any of those meditations that Patria does or any of the um, at home with Quest videos. Any of the videos that we do, like the one we're doing today, you can go back and look at it later, get some inspiration, remind you who you are, magnificent child of the universe, as I always say. You know, like they're all there for you to go back and to have a resource. You're always welcome to come on a program at Quest. On Friday, we just finished the most beautiful Healing Your Life program, and the week before that, a move and beyond trauma. Uh, I've been privileged to be on both of them and meet so many courageous, beautiful people. Um, who are all working with this. It doesn't get fixed overnight and we don't slice off feelings we don't like. The more you can get skilled at moving toward the feeling, making friends with that feeling, exploring it, finding the messages within the sensations, you know, the easier life becomes. So let us finish just with a short meditation. Thank you for joining me today and I hope this has been of some small use to you. Uh, I'm going to put a link also to the online course called Befriending Anxiety, which I loosely based today's session on, um, but it's a lot more detailed. Uh, and it's Patria and myself, we filmed it during lockdown and um, a lot of people are saying it's useful for them, so feel free to check that out. But in the meantime, let's just take a moment. It's always a good practice to drop in on yourself. Drop into your body, into the lower half of your body. Bring your awareness down to your feet. Just notice any sensations in the feet. You can feel the nerves in the feet, maybe the bloodstream as it flows through your feet, your ankles, your lower legs, the calves and shins, and your knees. Bring your awareness to your knees, your kneecaps, the back of your knees, the back of your thighs, the top of your thighs, the big muscles of your thighs, and the big bones inside the thighs down into the lower feet, lower calves and feet. Imagine the bones inside your legs. Feel into those bones. Be aware of your pelvis, the weight of your buttocks on the chair. and your hips, that lower part of your abdomen, all your organs in there settling against one another. And just bring your awareness down into that lower part of your body. Feel the streaming of energy in your legs if you can. Just the liveness in the lower part of your body. See if that feels good. Just keeping your awareness in your legs and feet. This is a good practice to do if you feel anxious. Just bring your awareness down into the lower part of your body. There's not usually as much emotion in the lower part of your body, in your limbs. Just keeping it down in your feet. And when you're ready, just opening your eyes. Thank you so much for joining me today. Until we meet next time, lots of love to you all and I'll see you soon. Bye.